Good morning, Grace. Uh, today we're going to tackle another one of the attributes of God. Uh, you know, and each week as we do this, um, you know, I think we need to remember something. Uh, I think we need to remember that when we talk about an attribute of God, uh, we are only we're very very limited in what we can talk about and how much time we have. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you each week as we look at these attributes of God that you uh, grab a Bible at some point during the week and grab uh, a Bible with a concordance and and look up the thing we're talking about, like the word good or or um, you know whatever it is, whatever attribute is we were talking about, justice or love or mercy. And when we're talking about these things and and look them up throughout the week and look up a, a couple of passages passages and look them up yourself. Um, because we're trying to give you a good general way to look at these things and some scripture to show you what we're talking about. But we have not and we cannot um, fully convey, for instance, this week, the goodness of God, you know, in 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, this is something that, you know, is is something that's learned over a lifetime of of trusting in Jesus Christ and, and reading the word and praying and, and experiencing life with God. But we do want to give you some good general ways to look at these things. Um, so, but I would just strongly encourage you to look at these throughout the week as we study them once, as we give you a teaching once a week. But throughout the week, look these things up uh, in the Bible and and read on this and meditate on these things. So, the goodness of God, right? What does it mean? Uh, and I think you you know very well that we should be going to the Bible instead of a dictionary, um, because if you looked up good in the dictionary, uh, you know, in my old Webster's, you know, actual paper paper dictionary, I think there were three pages of definitions for the word good, uh, because good can mean a variety of things. But what does good mean in relation to God? What does good mean in relation to the Bible? And how uh, should that affect how I how I live uh, each day? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, as I said in the dictionary, there's tons of different definitions. These aren't all of them, but these are a few. Uh, when we say good, we usually mean useful. Is it suitable for a purpose? Uh, is it enjoyable? Was it something that was good? Uh, is it something, or is it uh, an activity that you enjoy? Um, you might even talk about food that way. Uh, commonly, tasty would be a good. Uh, way we would talk about good, that's what we mean when we say, you know, um, that was good pizza or that was, uh, you know, uh, a good, I don't know, drink, right? We, we're we talking about the the taste quality. We're not talking about the mor morality of a drink or the morality of a piece of pizza. Uh, beauty, um, morality, kind, um, right or as in fitting or appropriate, you know, Good can mean a lot of things. So what do we mean by it when we talk about uh, good um, as it refers to God? Uh, well, one thing I think is pretty cool, I think it's it's instrumental in understanding. We see it in the very first chapter of, the, uh, of Genesis uh, when God tells us about the days of creation, what he created each day in general, and what he thought of what he created. And I think this is a really uh, important point to understand is that when we talk about good, the ultimate, not just the ultimate judge of good, but the ultimate standard of good is God himself uh, and his word. So one of the things that you'll notice, there's a lot of pattern that you see uh, repeated throughout the days here. But one of those patterns that repeats uh, in each day is that God creates something. He creates it by speaking and then he looks at it and he pronounces a judgment. And he pronounces that it is good. Now, in that sense, uh, we probably wouldn't understand him saying the sky or the or the or the animals were morally good. We would probably understand those to be uh, they were useful and suitable to the purpose for which he created them. Um, but we see that God is the one who looks the one who judges, and the one who pronounces whether something is good or not. So we can apply that across the board, not just when it comes to something being suitable or useful, uh, but whether something meets a moral standard, uh, whether something is kind or, or a person or a behavior or a word or an action is kind or not, all of that is going to come under the, um, the judgment of God, and it needs to come up to the standard of God, right? Because God is not just... Um, 
good in all the ways that we would look at um, because he conforms to some kind of standard. Uh, God does not have to come conform to any standard outside of himself. He is the standard himself. Um, not just it with usefulness, but with with beauty and with morality and with kindness and with appropriateness. Okay, so it, we're going to look at just a few of these things. I wanted to look at um, I wanted to look at rightness or or fitting uh, something being fitting. I wanted to look at morality and I wanted to look at kindness. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to the goodness of God than those three things, but I think those will give us uh, an essential understanding. So first, uh, when we say God's rightness, uh, we don't just mean that he's right uh, in everything that he says, although he is. Um, we mean that every action he takes, every communication he makes, everything he thinks and says and does is absolutely appropriate to the situation. Uh, one way we might think about good as in appropriateness uh, would be a good verdict from a judge. Um, there's all sorts of judges all over this entire earth, uh, and people would agree or disagree more or less uh, based on uh, a number of factors, right? Based on the, the laws of that country, based on their own understanding of the world, uh, hopefully based on what they know of God's word, um, but that, that kind of judgment that happens between people um, is not a standard any, in any way of righteousness. Uh, but when God makes a judgment, it stands. Um, because God is upright, God is right and appropriate in everything he does or says. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses, uh, he writes, uh, he says of, of God, he says, uh, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. Verse 4, he is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. God does everything right. Or Romans uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, uh, and Paul is writing to people who uh, who have an understanding of what God is like because uh, they have the law. Um, and he says to them, he says, you have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself. Because you pass judgment, you who pass judgment do the same things. Like anytime a human judges another human, um, the big problem is that Whoever is doing the judging is just as guilty of sin as whoever uh, is being judged in that instance. And specifically here, he's talking to people who had the law of God. So it's not as if they were looking at something and saying that's wrong. It's not that their judgment in that situation was wrong, right? Um, if somebody steals, it's not wrong for you to say, hey, that's stealing, right? But the understanding is, is that when they're passing judgment on them, he's like, also, you're stealing, right? You're, you're breaking the law in the same way these guys are breaking the law. Um, and he says in verse 2, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things, and the list of sins that he has talked about in chapter 1, uh, not an exhaustive list, but certainly a, um, a lengthy one. Um, he says, we know that God's judgment against those who do those things, who practice such things, is based on truth, right? The truth of God's word and the truth of God's character. Because God's word always tells us about his character. When God forbids something, it's because he is personally against it. He has a character which is against it. And when God tells us to do something, it's because these are things that are right and true and good and in keeping with his perfect character. Um, so what Paul says is when you, a mere human, pass judgment on them and do the same things, he says, you think you're going to escape God's judgment? Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Now, we're going to talk about that in a second, so I'm going to skip that verse for a minute. Um, but he says, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they've done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and f and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So we talk about the goodness of God um, as in rightness, as in appropriateness or fittingness. 
All God's judgments are true and right and good. So when God rewards someone for goodness or for persistence, as he says here, persistence in doing good, seeking glory and honor and immortality, that person is going to be rewarded with eternal life. But those who are self-seeking and reject the truth of God's word and follow evil, there's going to be wrath and anger. So whether the result of the judgment is wrath and anger for this person or eternal life as a reward for that person, God's judgments are right. God's judgments are good and that they are appropriate and fitting. There's something to something that's really important uh, about the goodness of God that we see is that God is good in whatever he does, regardless of how somebody else will interpret that goodness or what they might have to say about it. Um, I was sharing the gospel with somebody and they were telling me, you know, it just doesn't seem fair or right that God would send people to hell forever. Um and, you know, we could, we could come up with all sorts of reasons why we ought to agree with God, but at the end of the day, God is the standard of right and wrong, fitting or not fitting, uh, good and bad, just and unjust. He's the standard for all those judgments. So there's a very, very important sense in which we do not judge God. He judges us. If you don't think it's fair, I'm sorry, but that's just in the in the Bible – there's just no um, there's no uh, justification for a person judging God. He's the standard of all judgments. If you don't agree, really the only one you're hurting is yourself. So, you know, independent of what we think is right or wrong, God is always right. All his judgments are good. All his judgments are right. And so in that sense, you know, God is good. Uh, also, in the sense of moral excellence, um, when we talk about people being moral or immoral, we, what we mean is they either are more closely conforming with a standard that we approve of or agree with. Uh, and when we say they're immoral, we say that they are not conforming to that standard. With God, it's different, right? Because God is the one who gives the law uh, and he gives the law out of his own character. In just a second, I want to read something uh, that uh, A.W. Tozer said. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and read it now because I think we can read the scripture after. Uh, he, when he's talking about um, – well, he's talking – this is in a chapter on God's goodness. Uh, and he says um, that you know everything that God does is out of his goodness. He say sometimes we use language like the justice of God requires him to do this or that. But he says never use that kind of language even if you hear me using it. He says, there is never anything that requires God to do anything. God does what he does because He, because of what he is. There is not something standing outside of him requiring him to do something. He does what he does out of his own heart. You know, God acts in certain ways and he makes certain judgments because that is his character and that is his nature. It's not as if there's some standard of morality that God is trying to live up to and, and we just say, oh, he, do, he does it perfectly at it. He is that standard. He always acts that way, that way because that's who he is. Um, and so I just want to look at it just a few verses really quickly. You can see them on the screen. You can look them up and read them. I'm giving you in many cases just sort of the idea. You can go back to the scripture um, and, and look at it for yourself. But in Mark 10, Jesus says, only God is good. In Matthew 7, uh, Jesus is um, is saying to a group of people, he's like, you guys are, are wicked, but you know how to give good gifts to your kids. Well, God, who is good, you know, he, God, who is perfect, he always knows how to give what is good. Um, and then uh, in Psalm 143, the psalmist says, teach me to do your will, talking to God, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. And leading on level ground is on a on a, on a moral ground, on a right path, right? So he says, God's spirit, he needs God's spirit, God's good spirit to lead him in ways that are good. Or in Psalm 92, 15, the Lord is upright, there is no unrighteousness in him. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, he's speaking to the Lord, he says, you are good and you do good. You both are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes, right? So the psalmist, again, he connects God's goodness with a moral law, 
And so he says to God, I want you to teach me about being good so that I can be good as you're good. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 8, uh, Moses is talking uh, and he says, no one has righteous laws like the people uh, who God gave his word or to whom God gave his word. Nehemiah 9, 13, God gave just ordinances, true laws, good statutes and commands. Uh, Romans 17, the heart of it is that God's law is good. First Timothy 1, 8, God's law is good, right? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and flip to Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. This is what this is what Isaiah says. He says, "The Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and it is He who will save us." So Isaiah puts these things together. He understands that God is judge. God is the one who gives the law, um, and it makes sense, right? Because if if God is going to judge us, then it has to be or right that it is the one who gives us the law that the one is the one who judges us. Um, it isn't right for the one who receives the law to judge somebody else who receives the law. It's fitting that the one who gave the law should be the one who judges those who are under the law. And then he says, the Lord is our king, and it is he who will save us. And so I love to see the moral excellency of God linked with the benevolent or the kind uh, nature of God. So that's the other aspect of God's goodness that I wanted to look at was God's kindness. Um, this would be right God's disposition, uh, uh, special disposition, which desires and plans for and accomplishes the good of others. And just like he said in, um, in Isaiah, you know, after he said he's law lawgiver and king, and judge, he says, it's he who will save us, right? That's the kindness of God that he would save us, you know, that he would have good things planned for his people. Uh, Psalm 69, verse 16, answer me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. According to the greatness of your compassion, turn to me. Because the psalmist understood that God was so good that if he, uh, that if he, the psalmist, was treated according to the compassion of God, the mercy of God, that condescending love of God, then he would be receiving good from God and not the, the punishment that he deserves. Um, Isaiah 63, 7, again, the tone is God is good toward his people. Romans 2, verse 4, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. Right? Because God is good all the way, completely, totally, and he's even the standard and the judge of good. But he's also good in the sense that he desires repentance for people so that he can show them good even though they don't deserve it. That's how good God is. I love, you know, that in, in Genesis when it talks about uh, when when Joseph looks back and his brothers after the after the death of Jacob, they think they're going to be in for punishment um, from their brother for the things they did. And he says, "Look, I'm not in the place of God." He says, "What you meant for for evil, God meant for good. That's how good God is. That He turns the evil intentions of men to His ultimate good plan." So that even when people do evil, God can work his good through that. That's how good God is. Um, one of the things that I love, love about uh, God's goodness is how God's goodness works out uh, in a person's life who believes, right? Because over and over and over we've read about how God uh, is good for his people. And much beyond the scripture I've shared um, Please, I mean, you know, look at, look at, a, like I said earlier, look at a concordance and look at all the ways that God is kind and good uh, for his people. I'm going to read Titus uh, chapter 3 uh, really quickly. Um, Paul is writing to Titus uh, and he says, Remind the people, that is the church, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. So this is one, one way we need to remember the goodness of God and how that what that means for our lives. Paul says to Titus to tell the church, always be ready to do good. 
Listen to why. He says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy. Malice is desiring evil for somebody else or bad for somebody else. It's the opposite of good, right? Um, in, the, in the sense of kindness. Envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love, remember that is kindness again, the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And he goes on to say he saved us through the washing of rebirth, the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, that is declared righteous by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These are excellent and profitable for everyone. So you know, kind of in brief, what Paul says to Titus to tell the church is, remind everybody to be good toward everyone, to be gentle and considerate and peaceable, because God in his goodness to us gave us a savior. And the result of that in our lives is that we can then be good, imitating that goodness of God in the way that we treat others, you know, primarily because it will be excellent and profitable for everyone. If you're good to the people in the church, it's going to be a good example for them and remind them of God's goodness. And if you're good to people outside of the church, it might just be an avenue through which you can share the gospel. But it absolutely is a way that you can bring praise and glory and honor to God because you're obeying him. So it's good all around for you to put into practice, for me, for all of us as believers, to put into practice the goodness of God. So we want to end with this. What I wanted to do was talk about the good news. Right. Um, because the fact that God is good all the way, that he is good and that he is perfectly moral and he's the standard of our, standard and judge of all the, of all morality. He is good and he always does what is right, even though we very often do what is wrong. Uh, God is good in the sense um, that he is benevolent and kind. He desires good for others, even though very often we desire good for ourselves at the expense of others. So where does that leave us, right? That leaves us living in contradiction to the very character of God. But what, what happened, what God did to fix that was that God added a human nature to his own divine nature. In the person of Jesus Christ, God lived a perfect life human life. He did all the things that we should have done, and he didn't do any of the things that were evil, that were wicked, that were contrary to his character that we did. And so God in Jesus, he bridged the gap and he drew near to us. And then he lived the life that we should have lived, fulfilling all the requirements of the law. But he didn't stop there. He died as a substitutionary atoning sacrifice. He both uh, accepted or absorbed, as Shai Lin put it in one of the videos I saw, he, he absorbed the wrath of God that we deserved and credited humanity who would place their faith in Jesus, who would trust in Jesus, he credited them with the righteousness of Jesus, all the positive righteousness of Jesus. And then after he fully paid for sin, by dying on the cross for the sins of all mankind, he rose again, showing his triumph over death and hell and sin, but also displaying his identity as God and his power and his perfection. And now he lives eternally to intercede for those who trust in him alone for salvation. Anybody can come to this salvation. That's the good news aspect. We're all in the same boat. We all need a savior. And anyone can receive the benefits of this by their faith in Jesus Christ. And what Paul writes uh, to the church in Ephesus would then be uh, applicable for you. And I think this is such a great promise, and I wanted to kind of end on this note, uh, that anybody who would put their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, um, this is what God uh, says he has uh, planned uh, for that person um, I'm going to start in verse 4 of chapter 2. He says, But because of his great love for us, 
God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is so wonderful that God wants to show his goodness and the riches of his goodness and the riches of his kindness to his people for all eternity. And he's made this possible through the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, it's my prayer, Grace, that we would dwell on these things more and more and that we would share these things more and more. Uh, and it is my desire and our desire as a church for you, if you do not know Jesus Christ right now as your Lord and Savior, for you to come to that knowledge and share in the fellowship that we have with God and Jesus Christ. Um, and so that's my prayer for you today. I hope you have a great day. I hope you can join us uh, at church on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Have a great day and God bless.